There's been a lot of talk about what the internet is doing to our brains. Nick Carr, of course, wrote his famous book about how the internet is killing our brains. But not everyone agrees with Nick. Kathy Davidson is a professor at Duke University and the author of a book called Now You See It, which refutes Nick Carr's argument. Kathy, welcome to TechCrunch TV. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I don't want to just sort of put you in a box as being the anti-car. Uh, <laughs> so let me give you the opportunity to tell our audience what this book is about. This book is about the way that we're living in the 21st century with institutions that were designed for the 20th century. So of course we feel a disconnect and we feel like we're being damaged, but we're not really being damaged by the internet. We're being damaged by a lack of connection between the way we've been taught to learn and work and the new ways all of us are learning and working. What does that mean though that we're, that we're lagging behind? Define oh the nature of learning in the 20th century versus the nature of learning in the 21st century? Sure. Um, I'm actually a historian of the last information age, which was when machine-made paper and ink and steam-powered presses made books available to working and middle-class people for the first time in, 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 the, in the history of the world. And um, the fa this was around the time of the Founding Fathers, and they worried about it. They were worried that people had access to print for the first time. It wasn't a preacher or a teacher telling them what to think. It was they could read for themselves. So public schooling is largely instituted in the 19th century to help control and explain and interpret print to ordinary people and, and cause universal literacy. So the school bell becomes the... Um, symbol of schooling in the 19th century because you had to teach people how to live in a world where they were going to be working on assembly lines or working in factories or working in corporations at a given time. You know, if you're a farmer, you don't need any of that. So everything about school and work was about timeliness, uh, coming up with the right answer, hierarchy, and being taught what to think. Uh, in the internet age, First of all, more and more of us don't work in offices. Most of us don't work nine to five anymore. And um, yet we're still being schooled for a world that is a nine to five world. Well, before we deal with the internet world, I'm curious as to the, the core, in, in your view, the causal relationship between social realities and the brain. Are you saying that the industrial revolution created a, a cultural or economic <laughs> reality that in turn shaped our brains? Yes, and it works the other way. If you look at 19th century views of the brain, they're industrial brains. It's pistons and motors. And each part of the brain has a little part exact is labeled exactly the way the assembly line had a different task supported part. We, we now know the brain doesn't work that way. The brain, many parts of the brain are called to um, service for any task. It's not one task, then another task, then another task. In fact, the brain in its own neurological connections is a network, again, a metaphor of our era and our social era and our, our era, but it's also everything is connected to everything else. That's just how the brain works. The brain's a great multitasker. So that's a, a fascinating metaphor, the brain as a network. Yes. And, and as you're suggesting, it's no coincidence that we are now living in the networked age. What Absolutely. came first, the brain as a network or our networked age? I think the networked age came first, but because we had such a powerful metaphor, we could help understand ourselves as humans through that network. In the history of technology, we always use whatever the current technology is to explain ourselves as humans. It's almost like humans create the technology and then use the technology they've created to explain themselves as humans. It's a, it's a circle. Um, so, for example, Tim Berners-Lee is the person who wrote the HTML that allowed the World Wide Web, Web to exist. He is the creator of the World Wide Web. His parents worked on the Manchester hardwired mainframe computer of the 1950s, the fir world's first commercial computer, and would say, why do people say the brain is like a computer? It's nothing like a computer. Computers compute. You put in the data, they crunch the data. Brains are associational. Brains are complex. They learn all the time. They change all the time. So little Tim Berners-Lee thought, when I grow up, I'm going to make a computer that is like a brain, that is, is a network, that does connect people to each other. And the way he did it was using an open format that we could contribute to. So the, in, the difference between the Internet and most machines is we change the Internet by how we're using it. You know, the more you go to a site, the higher its Google ranking is. 
that change the configuration of the internet. And the brain's the same way. What we do changes how our brain thinks. Your book has been very controversial because you argue that rather than undermining our attention, rather than making us continually distracted, there was even a book by uh, Maggie Jackson on distraction, the internet is actually, and this, this new networked brain, is actually enabling us to be more focused, more attentive. It's pretty interesting. Um, there was a great study done by the University of Melbourne in Australia of 700 workers, and um, some portion of those workers thought that they were feeling distractive and less productive in their offices because they had email and they had Facebook and they had social networks and all of these things were happening at once. There's another group of workers who all felt they were monotaskers and they very were disciplined and they shut out all social media from their offices. Those self-described surveys were put against um, hiring and merit raise reports by their bosses. And it turns out the people who felt most distracted and who had all this media around them were the ones who got the most raises, the most pro promotions, who were thought to be the most innovative, who were thought to be the most productive in their jobs. The monotask, the lowly, slow tortoise-like monotaskers were the ones who were really the least valued as workers. So there's some perception about distraction, which may well actually mean we're, we're processing more information. I know that in the book you also write about yourself. You're an example of someone who I, I think was uh, interpreted as having perhaps attention disorder within the an industrial society conception of, of, of these things, but have gone on to become a distinguished professor uh, at Duke University. Uh, so there is a personal element to, to your argument as well, isn't there? There is, and we know that about three to four, um, that entrepreneurs are three to four times likely than the national average to have attention disorders. So there is some way in which if you only get A's in school and you're completely comfortable in school, maybe this new world is distracting. But for a lot of us, um, the distractions of the new age fit pretty well with the way we work. Um, my friends all know that I'm writing and doing my research hardest when I'm most present on Twitter and Facebook and in social media. Because whenever I get a little um, blocked, I go off the page and go to Facebook for a little while and I get revived and I can come back to my work again. Now in another era, in an industrial era, that was the function of the window or the water cooler. But we don't track those things as distractions because there's so much part of our life. Uh, basically a distraction is anything that makes you aware of itself as a distraction. Uh, we're constantly being distracted. Um, Gloria Mark at um, UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine, has found that we're distracted a lot, about every three minutes, in fact. But 43% of those distractions are created by our own brains, not from the external world. What's the role of speed in the revolution, uh, particularly when it comes to the brain? Last week, I, I heard a speech from Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn and perhaps the most respected venture capitalist now in Silicon Valley. And what struck me was how the speed of his speech, the speed of his thought, are we creating new kinds of human beings with speedier brains in this world? Well, we don't know that for, for sure. Well, and in fact, um, we don't really know what brain speed is. There's no way to measure brain speed. Um, what we do know is that people who do certain kinds of tasks get better at those tasks. So if you're a gamer and, you're, and you play multi, um, multiplayer online games and you're used to making strategic collaborative decisions with large groups of people you don't know um, in very fast time, which is not an easy cognitive task by any means. You get better and better at that the more you do it. And that's basically a metaphor for everything we do. Um, if you learn to play the guitar, you play it a lot. Um, for most of us, if you stay with it, things that seemed impossible and that you would play very, very slowly at first, suddenly you can play those without even thinking about it. Um, that's how the brain works, um, and we do accommodate to new styles all the time, and that was true before as well as now. Um, just new technologies make us aware of new patterns and new deficiencies. There's been a lot of debate about how, m how much technology, how many screens should be allowed in the classroom. I send my kids to a Waldorf school where screens are banned. I'm ambivalent about that law. What's your position? Uh, you, you, do you have kids yourself? 
I do, but they're grown up, but I have grandkids, in fact. And um, they're, they're very much online kids, but they also play the cello. You know, um, I remember when my grandson was um, five, his parents were very worried about Pokemon because they didn't know about if it would hurt his reading development. Well, in fact, he was reading a lot, and to play Pokemon, you have to have a nine-year-old's reading levels. Um, you also have to, you know, he was learning code, he was reading at a nine-year-old's level, and he was using the gameplay, he was learning design elements in gameplay, and he was going to the, to the schoolroom and using that to interact with his friends. And um, they very quickly decided that, in fact, all of those things were integrated in a very well, very nice way for him. And he plays the cello. So, you know, it's, I think it's, you know, we, we set limits the way we feel comfortable with as parents. Um, it's interesting, I think, if um, Rudolf Steiner, of the, who invented the Waldorf schools, was in, alive now, he might actually be a proponent of the Internet. What he hated about the Industrial Age was how hierarchical it was, that you could have a technology that it would allow you to create online and um, through programs like Scratch do beautiful um, multimedia interactive programming that allows you to write code and then see what it does right before your eyes online. That, in fact, is the kind of interactive feedback loop that's at the basis of the Waldorf School philosophy. Uh, but he was, he was inventing that in 1904 when the Internet didn't exist. It was a very mechanical teacher up front, students in rows um, idea of the machine in 1904. It would be interesting if he were revived what he would say about the Waldorf School of the 21st century. Well, I'm going to do my best to revive Rudolf Steiner. Uh, <laughs> but in the meantime, Kathy, your advice then to parents who have kids who are continually multitasking on various screens and devices and networks, your advice is, is really not to worry at all, not to limit this in any way? No, my advice to everybody right now is one word, relax. We've gone through an incredibly important revolution in a little over 15 years. That's very new in a technology. You know, the historian Robert Darton says there have only been four great eras, information ages in all human history, starting with writing at the time of, you know, 4000 BC. And remember, Socrates hated it. Socrates thought writing would ruin your attention and ruin your memory. Uh, Gutenberg is the second one, the one I talked about at the time of the Industrial Age is the third and now. So we've done an incredible revolution in the way we respond in the world. And we're just now starting to come up with the forms and the institutions to support us. So we're in a mismatched and uncomfortable time now, but we'll, we'll learn more about it. And if we, if we relax and take an inventory, I mean, I'm Ms. Technology. What does my backyard look like? I've turned it into a Zen garden. That's important to me. My grandson plays the cello and he plays, he's online all the time. In other words, we have to figure out what works for us. And it's one reason I interviewed so many of the uh, inventors of the internet and said, hey, how do you organize your office? And often it was in very simple, mechanical ways that we can all learn from. There's no right way, either from those who are trying to make us still live in the 20th century or from those of us who have kind of naive ideas about the future. We have to figure out what works for us now and set our own rules for ourselves and for our children. Well, Kathy Davidson, uh, the author of Now You See It, I want to thank you for giving me your undivided attention <laughs> for almost 14 minutes without looking at a screen or tweeting or, or, or putting something on Facebook. Thank you so much, <laughs> Kathy, for being on TechCrunch TV. My, my delight. Thank you.